What's up, guys? This is Caritos, aka Pete, the poker coach, and I'm back with another podcast for our Carrot Poker Podcast station today. Apologies for the slight delay in this one coming out. I think it was like a good five days later than it should have been. I've just been really busy coaching and writing, and yeah, little tad of laziness in there as well. I'll make sure that doesn't happen again. I'll get these podcasts to you more regularly. Today, we are doing a segment with my special guest, my good friend and student, Kevin. What's going on, man? Hey, how you doing? I'm pretty good. How are you, man? Very good, thanks. Awesome. And Kevin is a student that we've been working together for like, well, good few months now. Had a little interlude while you were moving house and stuff, but it was a good while. Um, and originally, we were doing like online poker together um, for the most part. But this is actually going to be a podcast about live poker because Kevin has recently decided to switch over to become a live baller. So I want to talk about that. What was What made you sort of switch to become a live player? Well, I've lived near casinos for the last several years, both in Las Vegas and more recently in Connecticut with the Mohegan Sun and Foxwoods. And I was, I hired you to, to learn coaching for the online game because I knew inevitably I was moving away. And I did move away, but I enjoy my experience so much playing live that I, I'm just going to make the trips down and play uh, a good 80 to 120 hours a week, um, nice. making a couple trips down to the casino now. So it's a um, solid kind of grind when you're down there then, it's very much yeah. a kind of business trip. Go down there for three or four days and really play 12 plus hour sessions for cool. a few days and then come back. Nice. So, How do you find that lifestyle for anyone that's considering being a live player? Do you think that's a good way to do it, like do it in big batches like that? I think it's different for everybody. Um, the, Different people have different schedules. This this happens to work for me, but um, one advantage is if you play longer sessions, you get you get bigger stacks and you get to be deeper as the night goes on. Right, which definitely. Sounds fun. Yeah, I mean, especially when you've got an edge on the fish. We'll talk about this in just a second, like what the competition is like in these games. But definitely a good point. The deeper you can be, and if you can become like three hundred BBs deep with a fish, like in position, sure your variance might be higher, but your win rates can be so much better. Yeah. that it's just going to be, you just have to embrace that variance. And I guess you do have to learn how to play deep then. That's going to be, that's going to be one of our main focuses now that you've switched over. Be, especially starting, starting out stacks are 150 to 160 big blinds mm -hmm. as well. So you start out much deeper than you're used to online. Cool. So for anyone that's just sort of stuck in the world of 100 big blinds and hasn't really played deep tables or leaves a table when they get um, deep, what advice would you have for... What's going to change then? Let's talk a bit about the technical aspect of that. What's going to change as we become 150 to 200 deep? Well, uh, the implied odds change quite a bit. Um, both your implied odds and the reverse implied odds. Right. So. And how does that impact hand selection? Well, uh, you'd, you'd be more inclined to play implied on implied odd hands. Um, you can... You can see more flops with more hands than you, that you might have to fold. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think in, even in the 100 big blind game, it's still, it can still be really okay just to limp like, very speculative hands in live um, because you just have such bad players and you have like these multi-way pots all the time where the pot odds and implied odds are just usually great. Um, so there's oftentimes when you'll be three limpers to you, you've got queen seven on the button, it's just a clear limp because you just have to see a flop in position with this hand. That's one of the biggest things that I noticed when I first made my first ever Vegas trip and played live as this online kid that was about 23 years old or something and I started off just playing the whole way I was online where you don't limp very much online six max cash obviously um, right. and then just started with this huge epiphany that you have to limp and you have to get into a lot of pots with these bad players so I guess deep that's just more and more true right you're just basically I guess pre-flop um, it's a fairly fit or fold style isn't it both with three betting raising limping to try and connect that kind of thing very much. Um, the, both pre-flop and post-flop, I think there's less call, less call for bluffing in general. Yeah, definitely. Um, at least at the lower stakes, like 1-2 and 2-5. Higher than that, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, you just feel like an idiot, right? If you like design a GTO balanced range and decide that this part of it's the best to bluff with, because um, it has blockers to your opponent's calling range, and all that stuff we worked on when we were talking about balance a little bit on our on online work that we were doing before. If we actually apply that live, 
we're going to find ourselves in a world of hurt when the guy who's been rambling on for the last 10 minutes about how <laughs> you're an online kid and you're going to bluff him. It's just like the old guy's just going to call you down anyway. He doesn't care. He's already got that in, in his head. So I guess one other thing that changes a lot is that I guess GTO and balance kind of go out the window a lot more live because you often just have way more info available to make exploitative reads. Um, right. How have you been finding going from that world of online very limited information to then having to actually pick up reads not just on what people do but the thing the way they play but also on like just their demeanor and the type of player they are and their age and what they say and all that kind of thing yeah you can gather information fairly quickly mm -hmm. yep. and let's let's talk through the the book idea that we had in our last session for identifying um the regs and like building up a repertoire if you like how does that work well we talked about um just gathering information on from all sorts of uh, you know all sorts of factors, whether, you know, watching their, their play, watching, you know, how active they are getting into pots, watching showdown, but also uh, listening to the things they say. A lot of times live players will, will more than be more than happy just to explain their entire strategy to yeah. you. Yeah. Their entire mode of thinking. It's great when you sort yeah. of sit there and the guy's just still like, yeah, well, I never play ace queen because it's just like a danger hand, and I just fold the preflop every time. They'll show it face up and fold it, and you just know that ace queen's never ever in this guy's range under any circumstances. It's great, uh, right, totally exactly. ridiculous, obviously. But. There's all sorts of nuggets like that from probably at least fifty percent of the players every single hand. Yeah, it's insane, and they just don't realize. I mean, a lot of them just think like, "Oh, hey, poker's a game of gambling, and it's fun, and it's okay to sit here and just chat about what we're doing." Because at the end of the day, they see it like they're playing blackjack or roulette, like these weaker players, they don't understand that any information they they give away, in fact, it's like the house is gaining even more of an edge against them because the better players at the table are just going to exploit <laughs> that. So yeah, it's nice. I, I do miss playing live. I guess I guess one problem I have with playing live, um, as an online kid that sort of grew up in the poker sort of 2010-2011 kind of era is when I guess I made my like major breakthrough in poker, and at that time, obviously... Like people were all multi tabling already, you know. There was just it was standard even by then to play like six tables, eight tables. Zoom was just hadn't probably didn't exist yet, but it was coming shortly after. And that's obviously like when people get used to Zoom, they can't even play regular tables because eight tabling regular is too slow. So how did you go from sort of being online to handling the boredom, if you will, of going from what five hundred hands an hour to maybe about thirty or forty? Yeah. Well, obviously, I listen to hard rock music on my, mm. on my headphones, and I play Candy Crush on my phone. Nice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Do you drink like hard liquor while you're doing those things? Exactly. And I and I always make sure to get high before I hit the tables. You better get high because you can't be too careful. And at least if you're high, you're paranoid about what people have, and then you're more likely to find the right fold, right? Right. No, don't play high. It makes you fold yeah. far too much. Obviously, um, there. Yeah. Um, so in seriousness, what did you do to sort of keep the mind active? For me, that might be a problem for a lot of people. And you do see a lot of people with their tablets watching movies, net, Netflix. It, there's so many people that don't pay attention. Mm -hmm. But um, that's one thing I don't I don't mind about live. I enjoy the social interaction. So just, just having friendly conversations with people while sure. you're paying attention, getting to know them a little bit. I mean, it helps your game a little bit because you, we had talked about picking up on just the general psychological approach to life and poker that people have, that the regulars have. Yeah. Um, just keeping, keeping mind, your mind occupied that. I do listen to the radio sometimes if I need a little mental break. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you can't, like, at the same time as you want to be switched on, you don't want to deplete all your will, all your sort of brain power by, like, constantly just listening to every conversation. Like I was telling you the other day, you don't want to sit yeah. there and listen to the guy talking about his kids for like three hours because it's not going to give right. you much useful information about poker. But as soon as the guy across the table says something like, oh, last night I was in this damn hand and, you know, then you're going to, it's like a radar that just sort of switches on and then you're in listening mode and then you can go back to... I'm, I'm to listen now. Yeah, this yeah. is... This so is there's the a balance again. there between paying attention and gathering information and, you know, uh, a mild distraction. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your most recent trip then. That was this week, right? Yep. It was this week. I got back yesterday. Cool. So how'd it go? Well, there's a funny story. I said, for me, I enjoy the uh, the live setting. I enjoy hanging out and conversing with, with people and, yeah. and that social interaction. 
but there was a pretty tense moment at the at the poker tables this weekend mm -hmm. or this week um, where there was a guy that got extremely angry, and you're going to have that from time to time. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's there's some people that don't know how to handle their shit, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, I was sitting in the one seat, which is the seat directly to the left of the dealer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how familiar the audience is with live poker, but the one seat generally has a little less space to work with. Yeah. Um, there, most, most tables have a betting line, but there's different casinos have different rules as far as what's the purpose of the betting line. Is it a courtesy line for the dealers? Just so you know, that you push your chips so the dealers can reach them. Yeah. Is it a technical betting line where if a chip touches the line, it's a bet? Whatever. Right. I had just won the previous pot, and I was still there was still a pile of chips that were over the betting line, and I was still stacking and racking them up when the dealer dealt the next hand. Mm -hmm. And I checked my cards quickly, and I had a, I had pocket aces, and I was on the button. Uh, there was a limper in earlier middle position, and for five, this is a two-five game. And I raised it to, it got to me, I raised it to $30. And the small blind directly to my left cut out a, a raise to 95 He three bet me to 95 mm -hmm. So I'm still in the process, it folds to me, and I'm still in the process of stacking up my chips from the previous pot. Mm -hmm. And, but I, I pause for a moment on that to evaluate, you know, the situation, the decision that's on me. I check his stack to see how much there is, what's the best amount that I can get to, you know, get his stack in as few bets as possible. Mm -hmm. And I decide that I'm going to three bet him to 240. He had, he had about 500 left. Okay. It was a small enough bet where I think he could call it with a lot and it's an easy get the stacks in later. Yeah. It's always good to rope it open life. Like as they say, because they don't tend to think in terms of this bet is probably like a committal spot for me where I should shove or fold. They're just, right. They just look at it as the raw monetary amount and say, okay, I can call another $100 or whatever. Exactly. So that you know, and that strategy of mine may be debatable. That We can talk about that too. But, yeah. um, but so I'm – the one seat already has less room to work with, plus I have a pile of chips from the previous. So I have very little space to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and I've decided on my bet amount, but I'm, I'm cutting out – my chips, that the stacks, you kind of cut them out to make sure that the stacks are the right amount. Sure. And my last, the last of the four piles that I cut into, the chip touched the yellow line. And as soon as the chip touched the yellow line, and then I pulled it back and restacked it and went for some bigger chips to put on top before I made my forward motion to make my bet. Yeah. As soon as I pulled the chip touched the line and I pulled the, the stack back, the guy yells out, string bet. <laughs> a string bet is when you have to make your bet all in one motion. Yep. If you can't take one pile, put it into the betting circle, then reach back and put more in. So that would have so just been a call then. As if when, a, when my pile touched the line, that's yep. it. That's all I can do. Okay, so did that even constitute like the men raise or was that like a call? That would be a call. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was only, I think the amount that touched the line was only like $25. So it would have been. Okay. Yeah. So you throw in one chip just for anyone yeah, that's wondering. Like I mean, like, if you throw in one chip, it's always a call, even if that chip is like a larger chip than the amount that was bet. Just be careful with that, guys. Like, you have to put in a multiple amount of chip. The best way. By Unless way, you announce raise previously. Right. So the best <laughs> way just to get around this is to either announce raise before you throw it in. Or throw in multiple chips when you're raising. That will also constitute a legal raise right off the bat for anyone that's you know just getting started with live. Okay, so what happens next? This dude's getting aggravated. He's like string He's bet, string bet. He, he he was very adamant, yelling string bet, string bet. So the dealer was distracted making change for someone on the other side of the table and didn't see it. So he he called for the floor, the floor, the floor supervisor yep. to came come by, and the floor asked for details of what exactly happened. And me and the, the the small blind, we both agreed on the details of exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of whose interpretation. Was that me just cutting out chips or was that me making a bet because my chip touched the line? Yep. And the floor ruled in my favor. He said that because there was no forward motion, there, there was no intent to make a bet at this point. Mm -hmm. So 
that wasn't acceptable to this guy. He got very upset, yelling, raising his voice. Maybe even some curse words came mm -hmm. out. And he called for a, a higher, he appealed to a higher authority. So they had to get on the line, uh, on the, and on the walkie talkies and okay. the floor manager had to discuss the situation with the, the poker room manager. The poker room manager came back with the same ruling. You know, it's not a strict bet line in this casino. It's, it's a courtesy line. It's a bet line that is enforceable with some forward motion that indicates an intent to bet. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Still wasn't acceptable to him. So he, what he paused the game, made a big stink. Wouldn't, wouldn't accept. He wanted the cameras to be called. And uh, finally they said, you know, we're going to continue with the hand that the rulings were made, either respect it or don't. So I went ahead and continued with my previously determined action. Yep. And he ended up folding and then was acting a little childish with threatening he's going to do the same thing every time that's the way that want to play and he moved his entire stack from the rail where people usually keep their chips yeah. all the way up to every stack towing the line just, <laughs> just to be a, a dickhead you can say dickhead that's fine we're yeah. all adults in this on this channel if children are watching this by the way go to bed <laughs> you're not allowed to play poker you're too young yes Live poker is not for under 18, 21 in some places. Indeed, we are big on this and carry over here at Carrot Corner. So does he do anything else the rest of the session? Is he like giving you No, he time? ended up, um, he threatened to be, to make the same play every time, but ended up not playing another hand. He just Can got up in a big fit and rage and swearing and yelling and making a yeah. big scene. And it's common, With right? Floor managers that came to the mm -hmm. table and had to be there and the big to-do he was making, it was quite a spectacle, like people seven tables away were standing up to gawk and see what was going yeah, totally. on. I've got a couple of stories actually because um, when I went to Vegas, I was there for about seven weeks, so obviously in all that time of playing poker every day, I just saw my fair share of blow-ups and it's just ridiculous. Like I think a lot of these guys are, they're losing players, right, because they're fish. And sure. when you're a losing player, I think there's just a lot of frustration that you're just losing all the time and it must get really irritating. It creates a very volatile environment. I think there's a gambler's rage is a certain thing when I used to deal in casinos, I was a croupier when I was younger. Um, I got a roulette stool, which is quite a heavy, um, like padded stool with like big long legs launched over the table at me because I didn't spend the guy's numbers. Um, went to court and everything. Like I had to dodge out of the way. It was on camera. They would show everyone all the all the management, the pit boss would show everyone for like the next three years or whatever. Even after I left the casino, this was like the most entertaining thing that ever happened. Basically, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's always the dealer's fault. You that's of course. something you learn. Yeah, he actually called me a bastard as if I'd like taken away his children's money from him. You know, like <laughs> gone in and beaten him up and taken his kids' money. Um, yep. But I went to court and I got, in the end, he ended up pleading guilty after having to wait around all day. Um, oh, really, wow. Really hung over in court. That was really annoying. So huge inconvenience for me, obviously, having to get up at 8 in the morning after a night out when I was like 20 years old. Um, and then I guess like the other instances of gambler's rage I saw one time in the Venetian casino which is like a lovely like one of the more sophisticated rooms at Vegas right you ever been to the Venetian that's the one I played at primarily when I was yeah. in Las Vegas gorgeous place right um and there's this one table and there's these two like big kind of Hispanic guys I think and they're in a dispute about like whether a guy had made a call or a raise like one of those same disputes you were talking about and all sure. of a sudden the one guy just stands up and towers over him like sorry like puffs his chest out like a pigeon in mating season and just start shouting <laughs> your mother your mother your mother your mother like over and over again until the bouncers the floor and the security actually come in and drag him away from the table because he just won't stop yelling your mother at the top of his voice it's absolutely ridiculous <laughs> and the other nice. dude's just sitting there like oh man i don't need to go to prison again and all this kind of thing i was <laughs> like holy shit and then um the other time was even worse so it was in the golden nugget which is downtown las vegas which is probably where you don't want to go if you definitely don't want to get shot like you probably won't get shot there but there's way more chance you get <laughs> shot there than on the strip right so right. i was down there and um in fact i wasn't even was i even playing poker i think i was sat at the bar like having a drink with this girl i met or something and then i looked over and there was suddenly this dude that was just like screaming um at the table like i'm gonna shoot you i'm gonna come and i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna shoot you dead and all this kind of thing and i was just like that's oh. scary yeah and he got taken away by security but it turned out what happened was and this is another 
lesson for aspiring live players. Like, be careful with the technicalities, right? You're not just pressing buttons anymore. You actually have to get the etiquette right and the rules right for how you act. Um, what happened was that on the river, the guy had went to make a betting motion, and he there was like a three flush river. The river completed the flush, and he'd gone to stick out like a fifty dollar. $50 or something, he was about to put it in the pot, but it's still in his hand. And as he's li like hovering over the pot with this $50, they're about like 700 bucks deep or something. Um, the other guy, his opponent, goes, call, right away. And then the guy goes, I'm all in. And basically, the rule was that the guy who prematurely said call before the chips had left the better's hand was bound to calling the all-in race because he'd already announced call before any bet size had been determined. Wow. So this had made the guy furious because he only had like two pair. He was like bluff catching the river. And it became very apparent that the other guy had a flush when he started, when he announced he was all in. And I think like the etiquette there is pretty bad on the better's part. Like I can understand why the other dude was pissed off, but threatening sure. to shoot someone in the face because of it's probably not the way to go. And then on the way out, he's shouting about how he owns like all these these like war military helicopters and he's just going to come back and like <laughs> torpedo the shit out of the golden nugget and it'll be like burning in flames and all this kind of thing it's just totally ridiculous but, because, but there's a non-zero chance that that's true i know right that's the scary thing it's like should we go somewhere else um yeah crazy so you gotta be careful like don't my favorite fight. one was i was at foxwoods once and a guy just lost every pot he went in he got sucked out on for three or four in a row and he's getting visibly more and more frustrated yeah. finally and these weren't big pots this was a one two game and it was small hundred dollars at a time yeah but he got so upset at the the last one broke the camel's back straw that broke the camel's right. back or whatever he took his cards and tried to rip them but they, <laughs> they were heavily laminated so he wasn't strong enough to rip and he was just like for a good 30 seconds, like, trying and failing to rip the cards. Oh and then God. got so upset, he just threw them and, like, <laughs> threw his chips and walked away. It was yeah, like, man. not only did he fail at poker, but he failed at his display of masculinity as well. Yeah, shame. When I was a kid, I was a terrible loser. I'd do things like go and play board games with, like, the extended family. And the first night we were there, I'd, like, lose at some stupid kid's game. And I would, like, rip up the, the cards and stuff like that. I was terrible. I had a terrible tantrum. I couldn't handle losing. And I think when I started playing like competitive chess and competitive poker, you just have to get over it, right? You just have to get very used to it. When you're playing for money, it doesn't bother you anymore that you lose at some stupid game. Basically, sure. you just you sort of man up. But I guess some people never lose that childhood, you know, competitive urge to win everything, and it's mm -hmm. kind of funny. Yeah, um, yeah, I can talk. Will happen live. Obviously, you're not going to experience that playing online. But no, you're just going to get told to die in the chat. It's not always like that, but. No, I did. I did get abused once in the chat by this Russian guy that just we we're playing heads up, and I stacked him a couple of times, and he was just like, he was just like pig, rat, die, <laughs> die rat, die pig, die pig rat, and this was like his vocabulary was like four words: die pig and rat and something else, some other animal, maybe dog, I don't know. But that was all I got. I thought it was really hilarious, and I think like cancer got thrown in there as well. That's usually one you get online: get cancer of rat. That kind of yeah. Thing. It's like yeah, cancer and AIDS gets thrown out a lot. Yeah, cancer and AIDS is the. The big two. Imagine someone actually did that live, actually said, I hope you die of cancer and all your family get AIDS. You'd just be sitting there like, um, yeah, like police maybe, I don't know. Like if someone says okay. something like that to you in this country, it's certainly nasty. that's like really quite a bad offense, like legally, you know. But yeah. online, for some reason, it's okay and they don't even get banned from the poker site because stars wants their money. You know, it's crazy. The mod comes over and someone's saying in the chat all this horrible, nasty, abusive stuff, hope your children die of cancer. And... All they say is like the generic message, like please keep the chat friendly, like no talk of cancer. Yeah. Like come on, you know. I don't know why we've like, not evolved into a world. We want a friendly way. environment too. Yeah, we want to encourage people that you know. Basically, the the losing players, the recreational players, are customers, and you want your customers to get something of value in return. You want them right. to have a positive experience. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think they do need to do more um, online to sort of win a day and age now where everything's on the internet and therefore things are starting to merge towards it's no longer this this box where things are acceptable that wouldn't be acceptable in the real world so i think the poker world needs to actually catch up a bit with that as well anyway you could talk about this stuff all day but let's talk about strategy now for the guys that's sitting there being like come on give us some actual make me a better poker player so what hands came up have you got a couple of hands that came up in your last trip um other than that pocket aces one that were that were interesting yeah actually i thought about that one after it was clear he didn't want to he didn't want me to re-raise. I, I should have just min re-raised. Yeah. Sucked yeah. him in. 
that's a good way to just exploit the fact that he's again giving you way more info than he needs to he's telling you that he doesn't want you to sure. raise he's not going to be able to stand it if it's too big yeah okay so I didn't think about that until after the hand I mean there's a lot going on right and it's like the whole emotion right. of the situation as well like whenever someone's aggravated it's hard to think as clearly as you would under normal cam circumstances so right let's talk about um, the first hand you've got for me today then alright so I'm, I'm playing 2-5 in this one as well mm -hmm. um, and I have 700 in front of me, which is the short stack, so we're 700 effective. Okay. Uh, the villain in the hand is, I'm on the button again this hand, and the villain is the small blind. And he's a very decent player, but extremely aggressive preflop. Mm -hmm. And from what I've seen, you know, he's three betting a lot, uh, okay. way more than could be just value, which is makes him an odd player for the lineup, but that's his what he's been doing and his three bets have been extremely large as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've actually seen him being aggressive post flop as well. Um, a friend of mine who also plays in the same games and knows him even better says he's not quite as aggressive post flop. Mm -hmm. But my read was that he was at okay. the time. Um, I have, I'm on the button and I have pocket Kings and there's, two or three limpers to me from early middle position and I raised to 35. Yep. The, sm the aggressive small blind three bets to 150, which is his typical three bet size. Mm -hmm. It's not out of the ordinary. So I couldn't get a read on the sizing and the limpers fold and it's to me. Mm -hmm. And I was debating, I had to decide whether I wanted to four bet or call. Yep. Sorry. What were your whole cards? Pocket Kings. Pocket Kings, okay. Uh, I know I'm well ahead of his, his range here, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I opted to just call, and the reason was that I thought that his three betting range was fairly wide, like we discussed. Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't sure how wide his continuing range would, would be. And it might be, it might actually be extremely tight. There was nobody, nobody ever plays back at anybody without aces or kings. Mm -hmm. So I think he's a competent enough player to know, to, to suspect that if, if I did four bet, it would be aces or kings. So nifty spot then in that case, if you've got that read that he's actually able to fold to just four bet bluff, basically with good blockers to aces yeah, or kings. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, and also I thought that the just calling the stacks would be shallow enough where I could still get the money in. Oh and yeah, one or two I think calling's definitely really reasonable there. I think the okay. only other line that makes any sense is to just literally click it back, as they say online, like make a min for a bit. That's just right. so small that he's just going to, although he's going to think it's strong, he's just going to peel it anyway because live players don't like to fall to like small bets getting good pots pre-flop ever. So it exactly. depends. If he's competent enough to actually fold a hand like, I don't know, like his king, queen, or ace, jack, or whatever linear kind of garbage hands he's three betting, then I think it would be better just to call. But if it's just likely that the population is going to call off the men for a bit there. I think the more money you can get into the pot pre-flop, the better, because he, it depends also how he plays post-flop, because if you think with your read that you had at the time, that he's also spewy and aggro post-flop, I think you definitely want to call in that case, because he's just yeah, likely, likely to get I more get money. Yeah, I better to post-flop as well. And if I call, the, the pot is about 315, yep. and the stack sizes are down to 550. Yeah, I mean, you've got like two bets left. I, I like call, unless you think that He's just going to be fair or fold post flop. I think you should call there, um, especially okay. if you think that he could fold even to the men for a bit. If he's going to call everything in his range to the men for a bit, then it's definitely a lot closer. But if you don't know that, I think I like your call, and I would err on the side of slow playing big pairs against very aggressive guys when they are capable of folding, and you're in a game where four bets just get a heap of respect and just have a very unbalanced four bet bluff range in that spot instead, and it's fine. I mean, generally speaking, we're not too concerned about balance here because people are just not going to be good enough for us to or aware enough or alert enough to change their strategy in the right way or even figure out, they need to both figure out what we're doing and then make the right adjustment to it. So it's like a, a twofold thing they need to actually achieve there. And I just don't okay. think that people are going to be doing that enough. So I like okay. it. I think the call is really good. Let's move on to the next one. Sounds good. Uh, well, do you want to go with the, through the rest of the hand? Um, yeah, that was a bit premature of me just to be like yeah. done pre-flop. Okay, post-flop, what happens? So there's 315 in the pot, 550 behind, mm -hmm. and the flop is ace, eight, three, rainbow. Mm -hmm. Not the flop I want to see. He checks to me. Um, I decided to check as well. Yep, seen standard betting there would be absolutely atrocious because just Pretty all the better hands are continuing. Any ace, slow blaze, all the worst hands are probably folding. 
So, sure. Yeah. So the turn, same situation, is a two. It's just the, the blank is the blanks. Okay. It completes the rainbow board. He checks to me again, and I also decide to check back one more street. Yep. Um, I considered betting for value against hands like, you know, queens through nines or whatever. Um, but I, I thought my hand was invulnerable enough where I was probably only going to get one street of value from those hands anyway. And I thought, why not get it on the river? That gives me a better chance to maybe get value from his other holdings that might pair up on the river or, or if he decides to, you know, take a stab after all of the weakness. Right. Yeah, I definitely. wasn't sure though, but I decided that was the reasoning that I used. What do you think of I that? I think that's perfect reasoning. I mean, in this spot, it comes down to, I guess, A, whether you need to protect your equity, which you really don't when you've got kings on ace-xx, your hand is about as invulnerable as it gets. Like yeah. that invulnerable doesn't mean that your hand is good all the time. What it means is that when your hand is good, your opponent doesn't has very little to no equity to improve against you, basically. Um, right. So that's really nice, and it allows you to check. That doesn't that in and of itself is not a reason to check, but it's going a long way towards checking. The other thing that you need to be true is that the river needs to be a better street for you to delay your one street of value to. I agree that you only have one street of value here against most players. So why is the river the best? Well, it gives him the maximum opportunity to bluff those times he's literally just got like king queen and has just completely missed the swap and that kind of thing. So it gives you more value. It means that you will have the maximum equity when a bet goes in if you delay to the river because you give him more opportunities to bluff and also. You may well get bluff caught lighter him by his range because he's on the river. He's making an end of action call, um, and he knows he's getting the showdown right there. So it may be that his calling range on the river is actually lighter than it would have been on the flop or the turn. So you might get a curious call from like pocket sevens or whatever, whatever weird hand he's deciding to three bet with his wide range there. I'd say that live players probably aren't concocting their three bet range very well. They're probably just taking a hand and being like, oh, be aggressive, err on the side of aggression. They're just three betting it. So I wouldn't be at all surprised to see like sevens through jacks and queens there as well. Okay. Um, so I like the way you play the hand from start to finish. Yeah, good. Okay, let's do one more and then we'll wrap up for this episode. Well, the river the river hits is an ace. Oh, okay, right. Sorry, I keep, I keep interjecting there. before this. Because I'm used to online hand histories, you know, and it's like you just get it all in one batch. This is like exactly. confusing getting this trick There's not here. much river to play on. <laughs> so. no. The river is an ace. It pairs the top pair. Okay. He checks to me again and... Now I'm thinking, well, now I'm going to make a value bet. And I tried to think what sizing I could use to target, you know, queens through nines basically is what I thought he most likely has yep. and that he could call a bet with. Mm -hmm. And I decided to go half pot. I bet 150. I, there was a little debate in the, in the forum thread about whether I should have made a bigger bet. Mm -hmm. and not. I chose that bet because... That's the most I thought I would get a call from Queens, Jacks, Tens, Nines. He yeah. did call. He didn't show. So I think that you can maybe go bigger there because I think that the live population is going to interpret a line like check, check, bet huge on the second ace as utter bullshit most of the time. I think it's just the natural human instinct there, right? Like, oh, this yeah. guy didn't bet the flop or the turn, and then he's just betting really big on this river. It doesn't make any sense. So as long as your opponent's not of the mindless, timid variety, you want to bet bigger. If your opponent is of the mindless, timid variety, then you want to bet smaller. Uh, that would be how I'd approach that. And by the, your description, I think this is a guy that is fairly likely to have an inelastic um, calling range here, which means that it's not likely to fluctuate too much with different bet sizes because I think whatever size you bet here, he can find a reason to call. If you bet small, pot odds are the reason. If you bet bigger, it doesn't make any sense. So I think okay. here you'll get looked up a fair amount in my experience of playing live. I'd make a fairly big bet here. Okay, good point. Should have bet a little bigger there. A little bigger, yeah. Maybe like two thirds pot. You could even make it like a, a. You could even shove if you had a really good read on the guy, um, and you were just convinced that his range was capped. You need his range to be capped, so you need to know that he never just checks ace jack for for a few streets. Like some guys well do that. So you need to first of all know he doesn't have an ace, like ever basically to do that, or very rarely. And secondly, to think that he's definitely going to level himself and call you too wide if you overbet shove. It's possible. There's some opponents it works against. I wouldn't do it just right off the bat against this guy, but yeah. Okay. Okay, so, one more hand then. Uh, sure. This one's a 1-2 game, actually. Okay. Um, the lineup is, there's an early position player that has about 350. Mm -hmm. uh, the read on him is that he plays his draws very aggressively, but when he has a pair or top pair, he calls down weak when he's beaten a lot. Mm -hmm. And he tends to take wild bluffs 
with showdown hands that make no sense. He's just a bad player. Yeah, kind of like a reverse player. Like when he puts loads of money into the pot, he's got a weak range rather than a strong one. Okay. Yep. Middle position has a hundred dollars, and he's just horrible and bluffy. Okay. Uh, your hero is in the cutoff. He has three fifty. Mm-hmm. And the button it has hero covered, and he's been very aggressive pre-flop. A lot of raising, a lot of three betting, um, but played fairly standard post-flop. Mm-hmm. You know, betting when he has decent equity, slowing down when he has marginal showdown value. Yeah. So, but early position and middle position limps, and your hero on the, on the cutoff limps with ace seven suited over limps, mm-hmm. and the button raises to thirteen, which is a standard raise size. Okay. And everybody calls. Okay. Mm-hmm. There was some debate on whether um, I should have over limped like I did, or whether I should have raised to isolate the the weaker limpers. How many limpers before you? There were two, the yeah, early like, position guy and the middle position like, guy. Online players will tell you you should raise here because they don't understand the life game well enough. You don't want to raise here because your hand is too weak to stand like the mass multi-way pot it's inevitably going to get. You are not thinning the field successfully when you've already had two limpers before you and you've got players behind who are likely to call as well. Like, If you go 30 in there, you're just going to get a three or four way pot. An A7 suit has not got enough frequent strength. It's not frequently connecting with flops in a great way like a hand like King Queen suited is to be able to actually want to be in that situation too often you're just going to be playing fit or fold so it's one of the lessons I learned when I first started playing live seriously is that you just have to take more multi-way pots you have to limp a bit more pre-flop and you have to play more fit or fold pre-flop to then post-flop realize your equity and shovel money in for value when you do connect without burning all that money when you're it is it's a definite difference and an adjustment for an online player for sure because the thing is online you're not likely to get that many mass multi-way pots and so your C-bets will have fold equity. Live, yeah. you're going to go four or five way to the flop a lot in that spot, and your C-bets will have no fold equity, and that just equates to shoveling money into the pot to have to check fold the flop most of the time, which is clearly just bad poker. So definitely call free, unless you think that you will actually get this two or three way very often. No, I agree with you, Reed. Absolutely. Okay, so on to the flop. So we're on to the flop. There's four players, about $50 in the pot. Uh, and the flop is Jack 6-3 with the jack and the three being my suit. Okay. Um, it checks to me, I check, it checks to the button, the preflop raiser, and he bets pot, he bets $50. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the terrible early position player calls 50. So he's effectively all in now, pretty much. He's not got much left. Well, he's the one with 350. Oh, it's right, the, okay, okay. The middle position player now re-raises, check raises all in. Okay. That's for 80, eight, only 87, though, so it doesn't reopen the betting. Okay. Um, it had it would have to be double the bet to reopen the betting. Yeah. So now it's, to me, it's the, the pot is up to, uh, you know, 150, 200, like 287, something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's 87 to me. Mm-hmm. And I know that the betting's not reopened. And that the other two are more more than likely to come along for an extra thirty seven into a three hundred yep. plus dollar pot. Um, I thought I had odds to call here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wouldn't raise. It seems like it's a protected pot now for a start. So raising for fold equity accomplishes much less than it would if it wasn't protected. And exactly. secondly, your fold equity is just probably not very good in this situation. When people pot it live at one two in a multi way pot on the flop, they're generally not folding through a raise. Just as a general read, so. Call is good. Play your hand fair fold. Realize your pot and implied odds. So I call. Um, the button calls the extra thirty-seven, mm-hmm. and the early position player inexplicably folds, uh, rather than putting thirty-seven dollars into a three hundred sixty-dollar pot. That happens all the time. Change nonsense. Yeah. So whatever. So we're down to three players to the turn. One of them's all in. There's three sixty in the pot mm-hmm. now, and the turn is the ace of diamonds which gives me top pair. Um, I checked to the the preflop raiser again. I didn't want to bet and risk getting raised off my draw. No, you've got even more showdown value now, so check yeah. calling makes even more sense, yeah. Especially since I have showdown value now. Right. Um, I wasn't sure how I was gonna respond if I knew if he made a small a small enough bet I would I would call. I wasn't sure how I was gonna respond if he had shoved. That would I have two hundred fifty left. The pot's three sixty now. Mm-hmm. 
So even if he shoved, it's a two-thirds pot bet. Yeah, I think you have to call. I mean, two-thirds pot bet, you need about 28% equity. Your draw alone is giving you, like, um, say that you could even, like, two pair could even be an out there. Um, yeah. You could have, like, 20% equity there, maybe a little yeah. bit more. Um, and so and I might need, be good. You might yes. be good, exactly. And you only need to actually be good a very small percentage of the time. And I'm sure you're good a significant slice there. Like, when people are pot committed in live games like this, They'll often like they, they don't like that ace turn, but they still have like pocket queens, and they're not going to fold it just because the ace came in the turn. They'll just shove it in out of frustration, or just because they don't know what else to do, or even because they think they can still get value. So sure. definitely just check all the turn, regardless of sizing, for sure. So I was actually pretty happy when he decided to check back. Yeah, that's good for you. Probably means you can just value bet any river card now. Yeah. So now the river is the seven of diamonds, nice. which gives me uh, runner runner two pair. Yep. Um, and there's no flush out there. A backdoor flush came in, but right. I didn't think that's very likely. No. Um, so I thought now it's time to value bet. He yep. could he could have ace king, ace queen, ace jack, kings, queens, all of that stuff. I beat except for ace jack, and that's probably betting when it picks up two pair on the turn. So anyway. yeah. So double flush draw board, yeah. I made a a value bet. Um, again, sizing might be an issue here. I, I decided to go fairly small to make sure I got called. I went 115 into the 360. Mm -hmm. And he thought about it for a good three or four minutes and then finally called. I like the sizing because when he checks back turn, his range is really capped. Um, most likely it's very weak and it's probably less than top pair. It's probably just under pairs to the board. So okay. I just think that in this protected pot, you're not perceived to bluff either, right? Because on the flop, it's protected. So you right. guys wouldn't be bluffing. It would be terrible to bluff because you're going to lose anyway to the guy that's all in. Um, okay. So he just if he's got half a brain, he should be folding to a reasonable bet size here with like almost his whole range. So you need to put him in a spot where the pot odds actually present him with a dilemma. And you're not going to do that unless you bet small. Bet. Yeah, I think it's fine. I think it's good. I really like it. And he actually decided to call after thinking about it for a while. And he, had, he did have the pocket queens. Yeah. Yeah, nice hand. I like all of it. Well played, sir. Okay, cool. Cool. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Hope you guys at home enjoyed the hand history as well as the discussion of really, really angry poker players threatening to torpedo <laughs> casinos. Um, I'll get you back on in the future, Kevin. We'd love to hear how your live trips and exploits are going. If, Sounds good. So that's the, the Mohican Sun, is it called? Mohican Sun, yeah. Yeah, if you want to go play some live poker with my students, I've got a couple of them that play down there. Head down to the Mohican Sun and expect them to take all your money. Um, <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, maybe not, but it'll be fun anyway. So head down there. I'm sure it's will be. It'll yeah, be if any of you guys are students of Peter and like to play live in the Connecticut area, you could go to Foxwoods. Yeah, of course. Just avoid. Mm -hmm. Cool. Exactly. Well, I'll be back next week, guys. I promise I won't have a delay this time, so the next episode will be out promptly, probably by next Friday. I might just make this a Friday thing from now on. That's nice and easy to remember, and it's the end of the week, so we can celebrate with the podcast of Carrot Poker. Um, for anyone watching on YouTube, you can see my contact information there. I am still taking on students right now. You can check me out on my website at carrotcorner.com um, or email me at admin at carrotcorner.com if you're looking to hire a poker coach. And I'd love to have a chat with you guys over Skype and answer any questions you may have. So hope you're enjoying this show, and I'll be back with the next episode um, next time. So adios until then.